Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Print 27 overview session this morning. I'm uh, going to give a couple more moments for any latecomers to arrive. Um, I know how difficult it can be to rush around and get to your laptop for a sharp start. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Numbers are still growing, which is great. Um, for those of you that are here, we have a chat box. If you wish to say good morning, say hello. And uh, we have a Q&A box for any targeted questions. Um, for myself or the spoke team, you'll notice you've got Jean-Paul and Suzanne in this chat as well. Uh, welcome back, Richard. Uh, Richard was uh, with us yesterday. We did an APM session yesterday. Uh, so any targeted questions, look, go in the Q&A box. Um, questions for me directly um, or questions for the team about the method or the training. So, um, yeah, it'd be great to say morning. Yeah, morning, everybody in the chat. That's wonderful. And uh, like I just mentioned there a moment ago, uh, you know, a couple of guys rejoining from yesterday's session. Um, yesterday discussed APM PFQ, the Project Fundamentals Qualification, um, did an hour's overview on that. If any of you missed that session and would be interested in uh, getting a hold of a recording of that, you can pop a little message in the chat box now and uh, Suzanne or Jean-Paul will be able to get in touch with you after this and uh, hook you up with a recording of all the good things we discussed yesterday. So if you're rejoining, welcome back. If you're joining us for the first time this morning, welcome, welcome. Numbers are still growing, which is great. Give just a couple more moments for more people to arrive. <clears throat> yeah, great look, couple of people. Yes, today we'll also be getting out to you. Not a problem at all. Um, like I say, if you missed yesterday's, that's the key one because we we'll have to hook you up with a new sign up for that one, um, which is great. Yeah, excellent. No worries. Get that over to you as well. So lots of people interested in APM as well as the Prince 2 overview we have today. And uh, look, this Prince 2 overview, we can have a little discussion while we're still waiting for the last few. You get today's. Do you want one of APM yet? Yeah, no worries. That's all going on. That's good. So Prince 2. Today we're going to talk about the elements of Prince 2 and mainly the big changes of the new Prince 2 7 version. OK, um, for those of you that don't know, um, Prince 2 went through a kind of a large scale updating, if you like, um, to turn into this Prince 2 7. What are the changes is going to be the question on everyone's minds. I'm going to talk you through the key changes in a moment's time. We'll also cover the basics of Prince 2 and why Prince 2 is as strong as it is after all these years um, and the best features and elements of it. So without further ado, like I, say, I think numbers are beginning to plateau. So welcome, everybody, if you've just arrived. Um, one last thing, I just remind any of you that have just arrived and missed it. We've got a chat box for informal chat this morning, guys. And if you've got any key questions for myself or the spoke team, we've got Jean-Paul and Suzanne. There's a Q and A box. OK, so if there's any questions you want to ask me directly um, or ask a member of the team to get back to you on, please use the Q and A box. So without further ado, let's have a little look at Prince 2 and Prince 2 7 in particular. OK. Prince 2 has been around since 1996, OK? And uh, it was actually Spoke, it was ourselves, that ran the first Prince 2 training course in 1997. So we have certificate number one somewhere um, in our archives. I'm sure our, our MD's got that. So Prince 2's really stood the test of time, OK? So if you're ever asking yourself why Prince 2, tried and tested is always my go-to response, OK? It is a best practice methodology. OK, UK government support Prince2 and run their projects using Prince2. And that trickles down into local government OK, and central councils and so on. So that really is worthwhile thinking about if you're looking at and uh, you'll see a little point later on, maybe adjusting your career. If that's a position that you want to go down, having a look at those central government roles, it is a best practice methodology. OK, it is globally recognised. So it's a massively growing market over in the States at the moment. Um, I've been training all over the globe this year, which has been wonderful. Um, Multi-continent as well, not just Europe, um, but in other continents also. So 
it is globally recognised, it's globally supported. Um, and that's never been more true because we have virtual teams now. So this post pandemic world we live in where everything seems to have gone virtual. Prince two projects now being run across the globe by international teams. Um, so teams that are working internationally with one another. Therefore, those individuals overseas are picking up Prince two faster than ever. OK, so really is um, one of the biggest wide scale rollouts. I think we've seen of Prince two in years, maybe since uh, its, its birth, if you like. Um, you'll notice that we've got two levels of Prince two foundation and practitioner level. I want to talk you through both levels a little bit later on how their examinations work. There's ever so slightly different uh, you know, approaches and responses to how we answer those exam questions. But we got a little bit more on that later on. Um, be interesting to see if anyone here has already got uh, one of these levels, if you're back for a refresher um, or if all of you guys are potentially new and looking if this is something for you. So either way, um, hopefully get a little bit of something out of this print to seven session in particular. All the good things the Prince 2 had is still there, which is the nice thing. OK, they haven't decided to try and you know, reinvent the wheel. They know that projects are still projects. They've just updated the ways of doing things and therefore their definition of a project and key characteristics of projects themselves have not changed. OK, so we've still got this idea of a project being cross functional. A cross functional project means individuals working with each other from different departments, different areas. I always give an example of my old local school, um, large school, sort of just just shy of 2000 students, um, one of the largest high schools in the country. Needed to update their cashier system in the canteen. I really noticed that it was cross functional when the cashier um, operator was talking to an IT developer who was talking to a chef because the menu had to match what was on the IT system and the IT system had to match what the cashier operator was able to use in terms of basic training. These are three people who would never meet. They would never even cross paths. And yet on the project, they were working very closely with one another. OK. So this idea of cross functionality, you'll also notice that your day to day roles may well get um, somewhat flipped upside down or, or, or squished or squashed or stretched because your usual hierarchy does not apply to a project. OK, it may well be that a project manager who works below someone in a BAU um, hierarchy is now above a team manager and roles have reversed. OK, so cross functionality is about saying that anyone can work in any role as long as they've got the appropriate skills to do so. We've got this idea of change. OK, projects introduce change. If they don't, it's not a project. It just ends up being business as usual. OK, business as usual is about generating income and, and keeping wages paid and bills paid. But projects are there to introduce change, push us forward, take a new step, go down a new direction. We need this change because projects start as a result of something, whether it's a problem or an opportunity, uh, maybe a new way of thinking. Maybe you wish to be more environmentally friendly. We need to change something or produce some sort of change to achieve whatever we wish to achieve. OK, and we'll come back to this idea of benefits later on. Projects are temporary and they have to be temporary. You must have a defined start and must have a defined end. If we don't, we just spiral and spiral and we have this you know, impending doom that's coming our way because we never actually finish. And therefore, if we never actually finish, we're never going to get any benefit from our product. OK, so this idea of projects being temporary, you have to have a defined start. You have to have a defined end. And in print two, we must also break things down into stages. OK, so we're really going to have a look at that a little bit later on. Uncertainty is another characteristic of a project. And because we have this idea of projects being temporary, that also means we can shut early. So this idea of uncertainty may be around, are we going to make it to the end, depending on the wider project context and these wider factors. OK, we are not guaranteed that the project is going to run smoothly. In fact, I can tell you now, projects generally don't. 
but the best project managers are able to keep the strings close to the chest, you know, pull everything in and to keep a good hold and manage things well. OK, and therefore, as a characteristic of projects is this idea of uncertainty. How does a project manager then manage this project? Prince 2 is going to give you a little bit of that later on, OK, as to how we've got the best grasp of all these different strings. I always say that project management is a lot like sitting at the top of a large 360 degree view glass tower because we've got our is is issues and risks over here and communication over here and reports going out over there and we've got to have a great big view over it all. And so how do we actually maintain control? It's one thing looking over, but how do we maintain control? And like I say, we've got a little bit of that coming up later on. Finally, and I really like this point, all projects and every project will be unique. And I always think this is best described using an example again, because if I gave um, any one of you, you could be a project manager for me yourself. OK, I'm going to give you a million pounds, 365 days, a mile of square, flat, grassy land and a blueprint to build a school. And, you know, you're very successful project managers, all of you, and I'm sure you will be by the end of uh, you know a bit of Prince 2 training. And you build me the school, no problems at all. And then what I'll do this time next year is I'm going to give you an identical plot of land next door, a million pounds again, and another 365 days to build an identical school. Exactly the same blueprint has been given to you. Although the product that I'm asking you to build is the same and all of the um, you know, materials and, and resources that I've given you are the same, the project will still be unique because you're always going to contend with things such as the weather, staffing, materials, OK, issues, risks. They're all going to shape your project in some way. So projects are inherently unique. And therefore, just because you're producing the same product, that doesn't mean you can just copy and paste your technique every single time. You will have to, and I think, sort of balance things out and uh, weigh one option up versus another. And uh, although you could learn from a, a, a version gone by or a project gone by, you may not want to do things that way. OK, there's good lessons and bad lessons to be learned always. And we want this idea of continual improvement and ever progressing. So there's the five characteristics of a project. And they have not changed into going into print 27 because a project is still a project. Print 2 is not trying to, you know, rule out or, or reinvent the wheel or scrap what they've had for so many years. They're just looking at making certain areas ever so slightly better. So I'm just going to take a pause here and just see if there's any uh, questions for me in the chat box. And uh, if we're all covered, then we'll have a little look further on. So what have we got? Lots of detail from Jean-Paul there. Great. Um, few people new to print 2, so interested to see what it's all about. Great. Look, we're just get in going now um let's have a little bit look uh, a little bit further in then so what makes a good project we've got to be on time we've got to be on budget these two things are pretty fundamental okay for every project um questions such as um what are the two key um elements that a project manager needs to monitor it's usually, are we on time and are we to budget? OK, that's what executives and sponsors will want to know straight away, whether or not we're still finishing when we said we'd finish. It can be a significant problem, OK, if we're over overrunning, of course. Um, you know, we use that school example. We need the school by next September for the start of the new school year. It may well be we have a certain budget if we're working for a large organisation, um, perhaps even a charity. OK, charities are going to be tight on budget because it's all done through donations. OK, therefore they don't want to waste a penny. So these two are absolutely key. Uh, we're going to call them standard variables. I'll come on to that point a little bit later on. A good project must be, and I was thinking this is a little bit amusing, well managed. OK, but what makes well managed? Again, we're going to get into that a little bit later on. Well planned. Lots of people think that project managers just do planning, but what makes a good plan? Well, Prince 2 has this focus on products principle, and therefore we need to focus on the products when we're producing a plan. 
I can't say to you, build me a school without first telling you exactly what sort of school I need you to build me. It may well be that it's a large high school, like I discussed earlier, for 2,000 you know, children and 300 members of staff. Um, it's got to be huge, OK? Maybe a square mile or two. But it may well be that the product I'm asking you to build is just a very small primary school or nursery school for 20 infants, sort of three-year-old children, OK? How can you go about planning the project until you know what you need to deliver? OK, and therefore we need to know what our objectives are. Notice it's just next door. OK, because we have a need and therefore from that need we can work out an objective. We need to build a school. The objectives are for 3000 uh, for 2000 students, 300 members of staff teaching people up to higher education standards. OK, we have these objectives, these targets we can meet. We need to deliver value or benefits. Now, exaggerate that with print too, especially because we have this continued business justification principle, which I'm going to come to later on. But in short, if we don't make money from the project, we shouldn't be running it. And that's one of print two's absolute foundations. So let's have a little look onwards at these in detail. Starting with for you guys, OK, why you should do print two. It is globally recognised. You will know how to start, manage and close a project through using the processes. That's another P word that we've been looking at, and I'm going to come on to that in a moment's time. Processes will drive you through beginning, middle and end. We've got this common language and terminology with Prince2. Now, if you've ever spoken to a Prince2 project manager, as a Prince2 project manager yourselves, you're able to sort of use the lingo, OK, and uh, sort of flex your understanding of the jargon. Which is fantastic when you're talking Prince2 to Prince2 project manager. But if you're working with a Prince2 project manager and you don't have that, they need to break everything down for you or you could do a picking up the ticket, OK, because the terminology is rather specific, but really, really effective. So really worthwhile having a look at the glossary. OK, once you pick up uh, some Prince2 materials, uh, you can find Prince2 manual on, the, on our site if you wish to pick one of those up. Know how to structure a project. I've already mentioned that we have stages we need to work our way through. Again, the process is going to drive us through sort of the storyline, but these stages chunking things up into manageable chunks works really, really well and is a feature of Prince2. Of course, it can push you in new directions. I already mentioned that it's best practice um, and therefore you might be able to climb your ladder in your organisation or perhaps start climbing a new ladder. And that's, uh, that's the point there. Improve your standing within your organisation. And look, finally, more than anything, you'll understand your role or just any role that someone who says I'm a Prince2 project manager will understand. OK, you will know exactly the sort of things they do day to day, why they do them, how they do them, and you'll be able to interface with them really well. Whether you're the project manager or just a supporting project support, a team manager, maybe you're part of the project board. You'll understand what the project manager is doing day to day and not only what they're doing, but why they're doing it. OK, it's really interesting to think about that. In terms of what the project manager actually does, We've got these seven aspects of project performance, or these seven variables. I've alluded to two of them already, and there they are, time and cost. The project manager needs to keep track of time and needs to keep track of costs. We can have what's called tolerance applied to these variables. So I'll give you a little example here. If we're building the school for a million pounds, if I'm the bill payer, if I'm the executive, I may well say, you can have up to 1.2 million pounds, but please no less than 900,000. And therefore, the project manager gets this idea of I can manage within these brackets. OK, and we call that managing by exception. You can manage for as long as you like until you're outside of the brackets and then you're deemed to be in exception. And so therefore, tolerance can be applied to costs. Tolerance can be applied to time. It may well be you've got 12 months, no more than 18 months, no less than nine. 
Now, why do we apply tolerance? For costs, we think it's quite straightforward. We don't want to overspend on our budget, OK? In terms of underspending, it might well be that we have a certain figure we need to hit, OK? Because maybe we've been allocated the cash, we've got to bump the figures up ever so slightly and make sure we're hitting the bottom end. For time, of course, we don't want to overrun. Maybe we do have a deadline. OK, think Christmas is coming up very shortly. If I'm still producing Christmas cards now, it's likely I'm going to miss the bulk of the sales. OK, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to get the most out of the project that I'm running. In terms of having a minimum time, we don't want things to finish too early. I'll give you a little story. The Olympic Games in London 2012 um, has the Olympic um, Athletic Stadium, which is now West Ham Football Club's um, football grounds. And uh, the government needed this stadium built and said, please, can you build me the stadium uh, for May when the Olympic Games kick off? And so this contractor that was building it were absolutely fantastic and had the whole lot finished by the end of December, early January, five months early. And the government said, no, 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 you finished too early. We don't want the stadium yet. And the contractor said, well, we don't want to keep hold of it. We're ready to give you the keys. And the government said, no, we don't want it. You've got to keep it until May. And the government did not put a minimum time tolerance on their project, because what would happen if they took the keys for the stadium? They would have to pay for the heating and the lighting and the maintenance and the security. But if they didn't accept the product until May, that wouldn't have been a cost of theirs. So negative time tolerance, having a minimum threshold of how long things need to take can be really key. OK, I like that example. I think it's uh, nice to uh, nice and easy to understand. We have quality as another variable. Again, there's no such thing as a good quality product. OK, I might say to you guys, I'm going to cook each of you a really great meal. And then I go and cook steak and chips for you all. Well, I might have some vegetarians or some vegans here. OK, maybe it's um, maybe I'm doing surf and turf for you. Some of you don't like seafood. OK, so there's no such thing as good quality, but there is something that I define as something that meets its quality expectations or a product that meets its quality expectations. If any of you are interested in this topic of quality, um, I published a blog for Spoke a month or two ago about what is quality. Um, so if you've got a little bit more on that, you might want to have a read after this session. Now, so far, anyone that's done Prince 2 is saying this is the same old same. There's been no change. This is where we introduce a new variable because you may have noticed that in the past there was six variables. We now have seven. Sustainability is one of our new project variables. Sustainability in terms of environmental sustainability. Every project has some impact on the environment in one way or another. So how do we go about managing our sustainability um, levels, our environmental impact, perhaps? Are we really eco-friendly? Are we really green? Are we not so green? Are we not so eco-friendly? What you've got to balance is sometimes to be eco-friendly costs more. But to be somewhat damaging to the environment is still relatively cheap and easy to get hold of things like this. OK, one time use plastics are still really easy to get hold of. But multi-use plastics as materials are more expensive, but more sustainable for our environment. OK, so therefore we've got to have a think about this idea of sustainability in projects and why we're going to build this into our organisation. Now, I don't know what organisations you guys work for or are aiming to go and work for, but I can guarantee that sustainability, if you haven't already got a sustainability approach, will be coming. Every organisation is going to start thinking about what they can do for the environment in the near future, whether it be legislative in your nation or not. I guarantee it's something you're, you're going to want to start doing. We then have this idea of scope and scope is the totality of everything we're going to include. What's in and what's out of our project. So I'll go back to that idea of the school. In the school, I'm going to have 10 classrooms. I'm going to have two assembly halls, three playing fields and a staff room. But what I'm not going to have is a swimming pool or a basketball court because I don't need those. 
OK, so now I've started scoping exactly what I'm going to have. It's like making a model or making a mould. I know what I'm going to produce. What am I going to do? Mm -mm. What am I going to build? And what am I not going to do? And what am I not going to build? There are th certain things we've got to scope out of the project. Actively say, no, I'm not going to include that because I don't have the time or the cash. OK. Risk is a variable. We can have a very small risk or a grand project level threatening risk. OK, we call those major risks in prints too. So this idea of risk may well be that we have a staff member who's feeling a little unwell and may have to go home early. It may well be that the building site is flooded and it's going to take six weeks for the flood water to drain. Now, we don't know the project that I'm referencing here. In fact, it's made up, but it's quite clear that those two risks have got some rather different impacts. And therefore, the project manager needs to manage and monitor all of these risks. And then finally, we have this idea of benefits. Benefits are variable because they can grow or shrink at any point throughout the project. OK, it may well be that your benefits massively increase if a new grant comes through from a change of government. It may well be the polar opposite, that your benefits rapidly decrease from a change of government. OK, if maybe you've got some funding that's taken away from you, maybe it's international policy, maybe it's local council, maybe it's just even the fact that trends have changed in this world of social media cancel culture that we live in. It may well be that suddenly something you produce is just no longer on trend. OK, if it suddenly makes it onto your TikTok homepage, maybe you're going to do really well and your benefits skyrocket. OK, and as amusing as these examples are, they're real world examples. OK, people are now looking at looking at the marketing of social media and how we can increase our benefits from this. So. They are your seven variables, your seven aspects of project performance, all of which our project manager needs to monitor and control. So a little look at the chat box. If there was anything, I'll go back a slide a moment. If there was anything on the aspects of project performance, what have we got? Lots of chat going on here. Could we have a link for the manual? Excellent. I see Jean Paul's just popped that in. Um, that's great. OK, all good stuff so far. Can I elaborate on sustainability? I don't see how environmental factors would be apl applicable to every project. So with Prince 2, it's a great point, Martin. With Prince 2, OK, look, we can use the basic example of a construction project. OK, and we can think about, OK, where are our, our materials coming from? Are they sustainably sourced? Um, if we're thinking about IT projects, we need to think about is it worth bringing all of our team members to a central location or because it's a virtual project where we're building a software, can we work from home and save on the travel um, CO2 emissions of everyone coming to a central office? OK, so it's not always about the project, the product we're producing, but the way in which we're going to go about things as well. OK, so we really need to think about both elements. Is the product going to do anything for the environment, good or bad? And when we're building the product, could we be any better to the environment as we operate? So therefore, Prince 2 is saying it will apply to every project because it's not necessarily the product you're producing that answers that sustainability question. It's whether or not we operate in an eco-friendly, environmentally friendly way. OK. Uh, let's have a little look over in the chat box. Is this going to include the use of AI? But um, is that a question regarding the Prince 2 manual um, or are we talking about sustainability going forwards as to whether or not we can use AI? Um, I'll give you a moment just to answer that. Because um, uh, like I say, the Prince 2 manual is uh, you can get a hard copy version of that um, or you can get an ebook version. Um, ebook does not have currently um, text to speech. Um, for to my knowledge, um, it should be coming very shortly. I believe that's something that people are talking about. Um, but uh, in terms of AI and projects, I kind of answer both points. AI is getting used in projects more and more and more. OK, in terms of sustainability, do we want AI taking over projects? No, um, there are things that humans can do in projects that decision making that uh, you know, on the spot analysis that uh, AI would need more information. Um, human beings have still got that upper hand. And um, 
I'm reluctant to say we'll always have that upper hand because we never know how things will go. Um, but at the moment, there is there's definitely an argument of we use the AI to maybe do some writing of reports. Um, but beyond that, project management is still a, a human um, skill to have. And it's not something that AI is going to poach from us anytime soon. So we will have a look now at another change between Prince 2.6 and Prince 2.7. Because if you noticed already, we used to have four integrated elements and now we have five. And they are the project context, the processes and the principles have not changed. They are three that have remained the same. I'll discuss them in detail in a moment. Practices is a new phrase thrown around, but they've simply renamed themes. What you remember as the Prince 2 themes have now become the Prince 2 practices. So I'll give you more on that in a moment. But a brand new topic for all of us here is people. And they have now made people central to the project because Prince 2 did realise that as great as their framework was, OK, for running and managing projects, it didn't include much soft skill work in terms of the human beings that run them or are affected by them. So people have now been made central to all Prince2 projects. We need to understand who's working for us, why they're working for us, what motivates them and how we motivate them. OK, and looking at getting people on side, motivated to buy into our product. OK, making sure that people are actually have a vested interest, actually have a vested interest in what we're doing and are supportive of the change. I often think like uh, a project is like pushing a broken down car. It's all great when we get behind and roll the thing forwards, but it only takes one person to go and stand at the front to delay the whole thing. So the topic of people is about winning the hearts and minds. And we talk about change management um, and communication management and making sure that people are on side with our project and pulling in the same direction as us. So without further ado, I'm going to break down all of the other four topics as well. Uh, sorry, starting with people, of course. And like I say, there's the two aspects of people that we would discuss when we look at the topic in itself. People working on the project and those affected by it. OK, stakeholders come up significantly in print too. That has not changed, but it's now moved into the people topic. And therefore, the definition of a stakeholder is someone who is or could be affected by or has an interest in your project. I exaggerate the phrase, could have an interest in your project. You don't need to be involved in a project to be a stakeholder. Sometimes you're just curious. I give you a real world example. The building next door to my home has just been redeveloped. It was a bungalow and now it's a three story building. I have no involvement in that project whatsoever, but I am a nosy neighbor and I'm a stakeholder. I'm looking every day to see how progress is going. If they do a really good job, it may well rise the price of my property. And therefore, I'm a very interested stakeholder. I'm very curious to see what they're doing and how they're doing it. I've got no say over how they run their project, but I may well just want to keep an eye. All of this sort of thing about who's involved, who's just curious, who's affected by or could be affected by is covered in the topic of people. OK, this is the new fifth integrated element of print two projects. This is new for print two seven. OK. Moving on to the classics, if you like, things that haven't changed the principles and our principles have stood the test of time. I mentioned earlier print two created in 96. The principles are the only element of print two that have not changed. And the reason they've not changed throughout any of the updates is because they work. OK, they have stood the test of time. They do not need to be updated because they are rules. And if we follow these rules, if we follow these principles, we'll run a very successful Prince 2 project. So let's have a look at what they are. Ensure continued business justification. This means that we must not only have a reason for starting a project, but we must always have reason to continue. If we lose our benefits, we should close our project. This principle, in short, means if we're not making money, stop. 
don't bother. OK. We need to make sure that our project gives us benefit, gives us return on investment. We must learn from experience. OK, Prince2 has been a massive advocate for this for many years. And this idea of we're ever progressing, always getting better. Now, if you work in a large organisation, maybe an insurance firm or you work in healthcare um, or you work for local central government. You may well want to share your lessons with your colleagues, OK, or other project managers. But Prince2 also exaggerates that we want to share lessons with ourselves for the future. So we keep a lessons log, noting down the good things and the not so great things from our projects so that we can do the good things again and not make the mistakes of the negative things in the future. Now, I always like to throw on here this idea of learn from experience and sharing lessons. The fastest way that project managers are communicating with each other is now LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the fastest growing project management communication tool. So if you have any lessons that, of course, are not confidential, I wouldn't want you sharing any confidential files, but pop them on LinkedIn. OK, um, Spoke and myself will share little lessons or blogs every now and then on LinkedIn. So it's worth giving us a follow. Um, of course, we can get in touch with you. And if you've got a quick fire question, um, it's one of the fastest ways to get in touch with each other. So this idea of sharing lessons. Um, for the whole industry is worthwhile. We can all learn from each other. Um, like I say, I just like to caveat, don't share confidential files, but if there's just a, a lighthearted lesson of something that went well, share it. Let's, let's uh, you know, we can all get better together with this idea of Prince2 pushing us all forward. We've got this defined roles, responsibilities principle. They have added the word and relationships. This used to be there, they took it out, and now they've added it back in. This idea of everyone needs to know what they're doing, who they're working with, and exactly what box they work within, okay, a Prince2 project. There's nothing worse in a project than there being an error and nobody knowing who caused it. But what we do need to do is praise good work, and we also need to know who did it. There's nothing worse than going like this in a Prince2 project. So who was supposed to do this? And everyone points at each other, no one knows, okay? With defined roles, responsibilities, and relationships, we're making sure that we all know exactly what we need to do and we all know exactly what our colleagues need to do. Manage by stages, the next principle, OK? Making sure that we are chunking up our project and not just trying to plan an 18 month to maybe three year long project in one sitting, in one go. The idea being here is that by chunking it up into smaller sections, we can manage more comfortably and more effectively. Managed by exception, we've talked about already. OK, we have our tolerance brackets and in print two, we must have tolerance applied to us. OK, if a project board or an executive does not wish to grant you any tolerance, they're still granting you tolerance, except this time your tolerance is zero. Now, I'll tell you this. That's not the best thing to do. It's not the best practice approach and is highly unrecommended, would not do. OK, but. If that's the executive decision, that's their decision. Regardless, we should be having these brackets of tolerance. We should be operating within them. And the moment that we go outside the brackets of tolerance, we need to raise our exception report. That's a principle. Focus on the products I already mentioned earlier on. OK, this idea of being product focused in our planning, in our quality approaches and in our development. If we know what we're building, we can then go about building it. We wouldn't just aimlessly set off to build a school without knowing what type of school we first needed to build. OK, hence why this is a principle. And finally, we have this principle tailor to suit the project. Prince 2 is not one size fits all, but is malleable. You can bend, stretch and fold the methodology to suit whatever project you're or running or whatever organization you fit within or whatever industry you fit within. OK, I've taught prints to to people in healthcare, to central government, to insurance companies. I've taught prints to, to scientists and to uh, mechanics, marine engineers in particular. OK. You can bend and flex and fold this methodology however it fits. OK, as long as you sit at uh, stick to these principles, you're running a successful Prince2 project.
So I'm going to pause there for a moment, recheck the chat box while we have a little look at the seven principles and if there's any questions on people from the slide before. So let's have a little look here. Excellent. Suzanne's popped the LinkedIn in the chat there, which is great. If any of you did want to get in touch, um, you can get, get in touch with any of our team members um, directly uh, through that. What have we got? Uh, so this is something we would have to tailor on our projects. Martin, I'm terribly sorry I missed that question there. Um, is this something we have to tailor on our projects? I think you meant sustainability there, going back to that sustainability approach. Yes, you need to tailor sustainability. And that's like I say, we've got to that uh, principle now of everything being tailored. OK, you're absolutely right. We need to tailor all of our approaches to the sort of project we are running. OK, of course, if we're running a large motorway roadworks project, there's going to be some impact. It can't be helped, but we can minimise that if, if we can. OK, if we're building furniture, then we've got a little bit more room for, for, for sustainability um, tailoring. OK, because it may well be that we're using sustainably sourced materials at a higher cost or we may be using uh, single use plastic at a lower cost and having to take the hit on sustainability. OK, so something to think about. Of course, what I would say is just make sure you're complying with um, any legislation that applies to you, whether that be EU or local. Um, not a problem if anyone is leaving. Uh, by all means, please feel free to rejoin. Um, thanks for joining and you get the rest on the recording. So uh, lovely to meet you. Um, but yes, going back to that sustainability point. Um, yes, you're going to bend and flex and fold it however you so wish. Let's have a little look in the other chat box. Tailored to suit the project. Um, every project is unique. Yeah, absolutely. Every project is unique and therefore we have to bend and flex and fold um, Prince 2. OK, you're absolutely right. Um, with projects being unique, it's not copy paste, copy paste. It may well be for the designs of the product we're building, but not in the way we go about building them. OK, so we really need to hone in on that. Let's have a little look at the practices, because I think some of the questions will be answered when we have a look at how we run a project in particular. OK, because these seven practices can be flexed and fold and, and uh, sort of scrumpled up and ironed out if we need to. Let's have a look, little look at them. OK. The practices are number one. Business case. The business case practice is what it says on the tin, how we produce a business case, how we maintain and develop our business case, and then how we confirm our business case and our benefits. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen a business case before as a document, but it is a written document talking about the justification of our project, OK? Justifying the financials, justifying the investment. The question of why are we running this project? should be answered by looking at the business case. You'll see that the project is going to make profit because of the change that it's going to introduce. Organising as a practice, OK, or the organisation practice. Is how we organise our team, how we build our team. The roles and responsibilities are defined in this practice, OK? Need to make sure we know who's responsible for what and how we go about our day to day work, all covered in the organising practice. Plans, as I mentioned earlier, something that project managers across all methodologies will do a lot of. In plans, we're going to run through how Prince2 goes about planning. We have a product based planning technique, which we would cover in a full training course. Um, so if you want to have a little look at that, do let us know. But with plans, we're going to go about the best techniques for planning. OK, which techniques we could use in certain scenarios, why we use them and have a good understanding. And uh, like I say, ultimately, the end of the training course would be able to send you away with the best practice techniques in hand. Similarly, with quality, making sure we know exactly what product we're going to build is one thing, but how we actually spec out a product is another. And therefore, in quality, we make sure that everyone understands their role within quality. And if you're a checker, an auditor, a builder, OK. And you need to make sure that your element of the product project product is covered, OK, whether that be from a mechanical side or a maintenance side. Um, maybe you're an IT technician um, maybe it's interfacing with other websites. Risk. Nice and straightforward here, OK. 
how a project manager can keep control of the risks because they are uncertain events. Risk is simply uncertainty. Risk is not a guaranteed thing to happen because if it was, we'd be looking at the next practice of issues. I think it's worth talking about these two together. When I teach a PRINCE2 course, I ask my candidates to look out for key words in an examination. Something may happen. Something could happen. There is a chance of something happening. Are all risk based questions? Because may, could, chance, perhaps is not guaranteed. OK, but with issue based questions, we'd be saying we have a problem. Something is happening. OK, and therefore an issue is guaranteed. We can see it in front of us and it is happening. So therefore, we want to fix our issues and mitigate risks. OK, both of these practices will go about the best practice ways to do so. And then finally, we have progress down the bottom. OK, and this idea of progress is making sure we are ever progressing as an organisation, but progressing as um, an industry, as an individual, going back to this learn from experience point of view. But also making sure that our project is simply making progress. Are we still going in the right direction? Are we still on track and on time and meeting all of our variables? How do we monitor these? What logs and registers could we be using to monitor these? All of those answers, uh, all of those questions rather, get answered in the progress practice. OK, so there are your seven practices for PRINCE2. Again, relatively unchanged. Um, those of you that are asking, are there many changes between PRINCE2, 6 and 7 in terms of practices, which used to be themes? Um, predominantly, not too much. The purpose and objectives of all of these practices are the same, but some techniques and management project uh, products have been changed. OK, so some of the old style risk registers, um, issue logs, progress reports, they have gone through some changes to keep up to date with virtual worlds and best practice methods. Fundamentally, we're still doing the same thing. It's our techniques that have changed. OK, so if you want the more um, modern and up to date ways of doing things, it would be worth you having a little look at a Prince 27 course. So. Our processes. I will actually just take a moment to answer any questions on practices. If there's any coming in, what have we got here? few in the chat box. I can see some chat going backwards and forwards, which is great. All going on. Templates, a business case. Super. Excellent. Nothing I've missed so far. Doing well this morning, which is good news for me. Look, the print two seven processes. Print two, as it says here, is a process based approach. OK. And that is our process model. A change from print two six to print two seven. They've simplified it. I think the powers that be at the uh, the Prince 2 writing board maybe realised that they had gone a step too far with the previous processes and added quite a lot of information. So those of you guys that have done Prince 2, you'll be pleased to know this has been ever so slightly simplified. We still have our seven processes, which I'm going to talk you through now. Startup is still startup. It's pre-project and it's conceptual. We have an idea. We're asking the question, is what we're about to embark on worthwhile? Is our project actually going to be viable? Should we be doing this? Directing a project is at the highest level of directing. You see there's three management levels on the left, directing, managing, delivering. Directing a project is done by our project board, our executives and our sponsors. OK, this runs right the way from startup through to closure and they are our decision making body. OK. Initiating a project is establishing solid foundations. We're still creating our PID, our project initiation documentation, which is um, effectively like our, our, our reference guide for the entire project. It's our baseline. When it's in the PID, it's set in stone. We also have managing a stage boundary just next door. I always call this the enabling process. Because managing a stage boundary is the project manager's opportunity to make sure that all the reports are done fully with all the information relevant to enable 
directing a project process to take place. When we have all of our reports together with all of the new relevant fresh information and we present this, we're enabling a project board to make a fully informed decision. So managing a stage boundary still operating as it was, has been ever so slightly simplified, as has controlling a stage. OK, remember that 360 degree view glass tower I was talking about earlier? Most of that happens in controlling a stage. It's the day to day management of a project carried out by a project manager, linking still very closely with managing product delivery. That delivering level down the bottom there where a team manager would sit is all about the building. OK, the hammers, the chisels, the IT technicians, the healthcare practitioners, whoever it may be, the doers, the specialists, they sit down at managing product delivery. And finally, when all is said and done, we still have closing a project process. It's closing a project process is about having controlled closure and a controlled handover of the products. OK, so the process is widely unchanged again in their purpose and objectives, but have been simplified. They've taken out a lot of the bulky words, the keywords that no longer need to be so detailed, especially with this ease of working where everything is be beginning to go a little bit more virtual. It's not, not so essential to have paper documents anymore, which the processes would have wanted to push you towards. OK, we're now trying to have this idea of working in this step by step procedure, linking back to that managed by stages principle from earlier. So finally, the last P of our five integrated elements is the project context and how you fit in your organization as a project needs to be considered. OK, I do work with some large insurance firms across the UK. OK, and their organizations have print to deeply, deeply ingrained and therefore they must comply. So their context is they must use print too with dotted I's and crossed T's. Commercial context may well be that you're working for a customer and print to does not just favor one over the other. We'll teach you both. And this idea of working with a customer, making sure that the customer is going to get the best product from your project is also key. The delivery method has been massively um, pushed in print 27. Everyone hopefully has heard of the buzzword of agile floating around and some agile project management methods are out there. Print 2 is, has become more flexible to include some more agile approaches. So when we talk about tailoring and, and every project being unique and we can bend, flex and fold this methodology, the delivery method for print two has now incorporated some agile techniques. So we'll go through all sorts of delivery methods on a full training course, whether it be linear or agile or hybrid. But we need to choose the, the correct one and select the correct one for whichever context we operate within. Sustainability, going back to that point from earlier, has also been pushed here because we need to think about what our organisation stands for, what we stand for. In terms of our project context, we need to make sure we are sustainable. And we need to make sure that we're working at the right scale. As I've mentioned, we can scale print to all the way up to be central government, um, healthcare, large insurance firms. We can scale this all the way down to working in a small um, mechanical engineer's garage, OK, where it's just one or two people working there. How much of print two, how much you scale that up depends on the context, OK? So all of these things get taken into account. And there's a nice chunky section that we start the week with on a print two seven training course where we break down each of these a little bit further. But for now, OK, Let's have a little look at the exam. So that's really the bulk of the PRINCE2 content. The PRINCE2 exam information hasn't changed. If anyone had uh, previously sat an exam, there's no major changes whatsoever. In fact, before I do this, um, let's have a little look at some questions just before I push on. Um, the Q&A, let's have a look here. Abby, look, there are lots of uh, changes, lots of inter um, intertwining changes throughout the method. OK, 
we can certainly get a, a bit of a this was that and now it's this and the other um, kind of uh, graph over to you. I don't think one of these is currently produced, um, but the changes are simple enough to go through. Um, no problems at all. So if that's something you're interested in, um, we can certainly have a, a little look at that for you. Martin has had a look. Has the project environment been renamed project context? Um, yes, so projects in context was the overarching term. Um, effectively, they've got rid of the word in and they've um, the project environment has now become this project context term. So yeah, great spot. Martin, change has been taken out. Yes, and been replaced by issues. Um, so change has always been issues. Martin, you are uh, you know, been uh, Prince2 uh, before, definitely. You can see uh, some of the old terminology coming through. But yes, look, change is issues. Um, because if you ever remember back to the change theme, we used to talk about the three types of issue, um, request for change, problem or concern, and an off specification. So there was never really a point for it being called change because all three of those are types of issue. Even a request for change is dealt with as an issue. Um, so it's simply just been renamed. So absolutely. Um, look, great stuff there. Let's have a look at the examination. OK. Things haven't drastically changed at all in terms of the exam. The foundation, there's been no change whatsoever. It's still closed book. It's still 60 questions. It's still 60 minutes and you've still got to get uh, 60 to pass. In fact, do excuse me, it used to be 55 to pass. So there is a slight change there. It's a slightly higher pass mark. You've got to get 36 now. OK, but is multiple choice. They have not dropped the A, B, C or D approach. OK, it is still as simple as it was. And the people search system has been updated and uh, is now silky smooth. So uh, I've got to say they've really pushed the boundary of what they can do in terms of um, their examination process. Um, so really worthwhile. If you haven't sat that, it's never been easier. Those of you that are looking at practitioner, uh, maybe for the first time or looking at redoing, you will need to get yourselves a new copy of the Prince 27 manual. For the practitioner, whether that be ebook or paper copy, the choice is yours because the practitioner is an open book um, examination. You can use only the print to seven manual, however. And in terms of the specifications. The scenarios you will use are now in the manual itself, so it's not a surprise when you rock up to the exam that you've got a IT um, project to look at. Or you've got a construction project to look at. You'll know you're going to get one of three or maybe one of four scenarios in the Prince 2 manual that you know you're going to choose from. OK, so they've simplified it ever so slightly. Have added two questions on, however. So it is now 70 questions. 150 minutes as it always was. 60 percent to pass rather than the 55. OK. Multiple choice and matching, exactly the same as it was before, A, B, C or D. And you then have a list of A to F and one to, I think that'd be seven. Um, OK, you can then match up one with the other. OK, so all still operating in the same way, but just being updated to suit this new print 27 world that we live in. So if there's any questions on the exam, we have a little look. Um, how does the new Prince 27 link in with Prince 2 Agile? So Prince 2 Agile is still Prince 2's sole Agile approach. OK, um, Prince 2 Agile 7, I'm sure will be coming in the near future. But Prince 2 Agile as it stands doesn't need updating too much because it wasn't long updated. OK, only a few years ago. And therefore, Prince 2 in itself, the original Prince 2 um, was due a little update, especially in this um, sort of post COVID world we live in, whereas Prince 2 Agile kind of got a lot of things that Prince 2 is now taken from it rather. OK, still two separate methods. OK, Prince 2 still very much set up to be the generic flexible version, um, but the Prince 2 Agile approach very much looking at Agile specific projects. So they are still separate um, and now they're just sort of sharing a little bit more. OK, um, Prince 2 Agile leaning on sustainability um, many moons ago. So Prince 2 really has caught things up in, in that sense. There are some other changes I'm sure.